So first of all, before I introduce our guest speaker for, the, for today, I just wanted to take a few minutes to explain the, the immune system and also cattle diseases in a more general scope before getting too specific. Uh, I think it's some valuable information that we just need to get our head around. So first of all, we can very broadly group cattle diseases into one of two categories. The category that you see there on the left is what I like to say is related to the immune system itself. And what I mean by that is, these are things like infectious diseases that occur when the immune system is overwhelmed and so your animal gets sick. An example is something like clostridial diseases, for example. On the right hand side are diseases that I say are unrelated to the immune system. And these are, for example, metabolic diseases, things like milk fever, um, things like uh, acidosis. These are not really directly related to the immune system. And out of all these diseases, what we're going to focus here on today is really this component here on the left, i.e. things that are related to the immune system. So the, the MLA has done some really excellent work in being able to uh, quantify the cost of diseases to Australian cattle producers. And they've provided a list of what they consider to be economically significant diseases, like you see there um, on your screen, things like three day, calf scours, clostridial, pink eye, BRD, mastitis, and so on. And for beef producers, the cost is actually very, very significant. It's almost at $500 million per year. And for dairy producers, we're looking at um, a total of approximately $150 million per year, which is, which is massive when you add it all up. So therefore, it sort of shows you how important it is then to make sure that the immune system of your animal is running well, because having a good running immune system, having a good vaccine program, means that your, your likelihood of succumbing to these diseases are far reduced. Now, before we move on to the presentation itself, I'd like to show you a quick video that sort of gives you a bit of an understanding or rather an introduction as to how the immune system works. Uh, and this is very important because a lot of the presentation will cover some of the details that you see in this video. So bear with me as I uh, turn on my little video. So that You should be having a thing that's going to pop up on your screen pretty soon. Um, and it's going to play a video for you any second now. So there is audio, uh, so you should be able to hear it. In the first few seconds, there's no audio, but uh, yeah, it'll kick in pretty soon. Uh, Germs can attack and challenge livestock through a number of different ways. The immune system is like a well-trained army, ready to defend the body from disease. It is broadly made up of three major components. The first are physical barriers, which act as a perimeter wall. The second is the non-specific immune response, which is like a platoon of infantry and their weapons. The third is the specific immune response, which are like smart weapons. Physical barriers such as the skin and hoof do a good job of keeping germs out of the body. However, suboptimal levels of trace minerals may weaken physical barriers, while other germs simply find a way past. Once past the physical barriers, germs will face the non-specific immune response, which is made up of immune cells with different roles. Some immune cells are scouts that can quickly spot and engage the germ. Other immune cells are communication specialists that can call in other immune cell reinforcements. Some immune cells can swarm and attack the germ, and they can also produce powerful explosions to kill germs. The explosions used by immune cells are called oxidative bursts and can be dangerous to the body if they are not controlled. Antioxidants derived from trace minerals are used to control the explosions. However, if trace mineral levels are suboptimal, there is an increased chance of oxidative bursts causing more collateral damage. In fact, trace minerals are important for all immune cells as they help protect their health and function. The specific immune system requires a long time and a lot of resources before it is ready for use. The manufacturing process of these weapons requires high levels of trace minerals. The specific immune system works by the body learning about the specific type of germ so antibodies can be used to accurately lock onto a target. Smart weapons or lymphocytes then kill the germ with high precision and minimal collateral damage. 
The four trace minerals, copper, zinc, manganese and selenium, are all important for the immune system. They are required for the health and function of each of the three components of the immune system. All right, I'm just going to pause it there and switch back to the presentation. Hopefully that worked for everyone. Bear with me while I show my screen again. Spiel, having a bit of a technical issue here, can't seem to quit the video. Okay, here we go. Okay, I think that should be working. Roberto, you can see my screen now, can you? Yeah. Yep, great, okay. All right, let's resume. So, um, before we get started, I also wanted to, to make uh, a couple of points. So a lot of the information that you'll see here today presented by our guest speaker is going to focus, of course, on research findings and, and scientific research, of course, then focuses on things that we can see and, and things we can measure. And so the webinar will, of course, uh, cover specific examples of diseases. For example, BRD will be a bit of a focus because this is a type of research that has been conducted. Um, but one comment that I'd like to make is really we're not looking at the impact of multimedia evolution on BRD specifically. BRD is simply a, a model that we have used to, uh, I guess, um, uh, show how multimedia can be used to improve the immune function of an animal in general. And this is really important because improving immune function in general then helps to reduce the disease occurrence and also the severity of diseases in, in general as well. So it applies to the immune system as a whole. And so a lot of the findings here that you can actually extrapolate to other diseases that are more specific to your particular operation. Now, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker today. So beaming in live all the way from the US, um, 10 p.m. over there, in fact. So Dr. Roberto Palomares, he is a practicing veterinarian, so probably not unused to working unusual hours, but he's an associate professor at the University of Georgia uh, within the College of Veterinary Medicine. So he heads up a lab called Gravid, uh, and it's a research team which looks at, or the, 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 the organization stands for Group for Reproduction in Animals, Vaccinology and Infectious Diseases. And as you can tell by the name of the, the team, they specialize in reproduction and of course also um, for, uh, vaccines and infectious diseases as well. So in addition to that, Roberto also has a PhD in Biomedical Sciences and a Master of Science as well. So certainly very well qualified to talk about what we're here to see today. So without further ado, I'm going to flick over to you now, Roberto, and um, let's see if I can uh, change my presenter to you. Yeah, here we go. There we go. Perfect. All right. Okay. All right. Good to go. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. It's for me a pleasure to be today talking about our research at the University of Georgia. And today I'm going to talk about the effects of injectable trace minerals, specifically multimine evolution on prevention of cattle diseases. As, as uh, Lou, Dr. Liu was uh, telling you, um, we have done some research and using some vaccination challenge models to demonstrate the effect of trace minerals on the immune system. So, but this knowledge can be extrapolated, you know, to other conditions, not necessarily related with vaccine, vaccine challenge uh, models. So first of all, uh, I want to, to mention that, yes, okay that health and reproduction are the cornerstone for, you know, uh, cattle production systems, you know, and cattle health depends on the immune system. And as, as we know, you know, in order to have an adequate immune function, it's necessary to have an optimal nutrition. So it's important to provide what is needed for the, for the immune system to have an adequate response, you know, against any pathogens to which the animal is exposed, but also to, you know, after vaccination and have a better protection. 
So it's important to provide adequate and op optimal levels of protein, energy, as well as vitamins uh, such as vitamin E and the complex B, especially in young animals. And for the case of trace minerals, it's very important that the animal is receiving uh, optimal levels of copper, zinc, and selenium, since they are very important antioxidants to keep, as Dr. Uh, Liu was telling you, to keep an optimal balance between the pro-oxidants that are necessary for the immune system to work, but also to keep those levels in a, in, in, in a level that is not uh, harmful for the, the, the immune system cells. So, you know, these trace minerals, as we said, are antioxidants because they are part of the enzymes that decrease or reduce the free radicals or the pro-oxidants that, you know, these uh, enzymes are the superoxide, these mutase and the glutathione peroxidase. So these enzymes are necessary, you know, for reducing or neutralizing the levels of um, uh, free radicals or reactive oxygen species. So copper, zinc, and manganese, these are important as a structure of the superoxide dismutase enzyme. Also, selenium is part, a structural part of the glutathione peroxidase, the GPX. This enzyme also helps reducing the levels of free radicals. These uh, levels are really high during stress situations. And when we talk about stress situations, not only is when we see the animal in stress. Stress is a normal physiological function that any system, any cell in the, in, in the animal is submitted uh, under certain circumstances. You know, it's something normal that happens in the animals. Uh, and, but these trace minerals, you know, when they are in, in adequate levels, prevent the damage that can be caused uh, to white blood cells by reactive oxygen species or free radicals that are produced by the cells. And, you know, uh, keeping these levels uh, optimal it will stimulate the immune defenses as well. Several diseases that occur in dairy and beef farms uh, are the results of uh, or are associated with an imbalance uh, between pro-oxidants and the antioxidant system. And, you know, when there is an increase in the oxidative stress in the animals, then we see an, in an increasing the incidence of uh, diseases such as mastitis, retained placenta, uh, metritis, uh, lameness, and also uh, respiratory and gastrointestinal disease, known better as diarrhea. So just that when there is an imbalance between pro-oxidant and antioxidant, the, animal, the animals are more susceptible to suffer these diseases, so are more uh, vulnerable uh, for infections. But trace minerals have also a specific functions within the immune system. And we know that they are important for the bacteria killing by the white blood cells. For example, copper is very important in this function, killing bacteria. Selenium is also very important for uh, helping in the migration of the white blood cells from the bloodstream uh, to the site of infection. Also, it's important reducing the level of inflammation and uh, another important trace mineral is zinc because it's required for mucosal healing and for keeping the health you know, for, and the integrity of any mucosal lining, like this picture showing you know, the normal epithelium of the respiratory tract, you know, of, the, of the trachea. And then you know, when there are zinc deficiencies, you can see that the animals are more sus susceptible to suffer, to suffer ulcers or, or any kind of lesions at the respiratory tract or also at the digestive tract. Um, zinc is very important for the multiplication, for division of uh, cells in the immune system, the white blood cells. Uh, so we call it proliferation, white blood cell proliferation. So zinc is crucial for that. And manganese is also important uh, for antibody production and cell mediated immunity. In general, all of these uh, trace minerals are required, are essential 
for the innate immunity, you know, for the immunity that is already present in the animal, the general immunity, but also for a specific immunity as the video was showing at the beginning, you know, for a immunity that, that is directed is a focus on, specifically on some pathogens. This panel is showing, you know, the normal decay in antibodies, in maternal antibodies. So normally in animals, uh, during their life, you know, after they consume colostrum, calf, you know, have high levels after consuming colostrum, have high levels of antibodies. In this graph, we can see the antibody titers against pestivirus and against IVR. Uh, and we see how as days goes, the levels of antibodies that were uh, received in the colostrum, they decay. This is a normal uh, decay that happens, especially in animals that are not vaccinated at this point. And this, of course, will make the animals susceptible at certain point when if the animals are exposed to these pathogens, to pestivirus or a uh, herpes virus, you know, the IVR virus, then the animals are susceptible to suffer the infection. This is normal DCK. So we need to be prepared for providing, you know, the stimulation with vaccination in order to increase these antibodies. And also, uh, it's important to remember that there is a normal decay in the levels of these trace minerals. So in these panels, you can see how the after birth, the levels of zinc, selenium, and copper decay right after, you know, like at two months of age, the levels of zinc are uh, almost reaching um, uh, marginal levels. And we can see also for selenium in this panel, like around uh, 200 days, seven months of age, um, the levels are so low that make the animal uh, uh, susceptible, you know, to have an antioxidant uh, deficiency, you know, with an uh, oxidative imbalance. And you, you can co uh, confirm the same for copper here that just at two months of age, the levels are just marginal. So this normal decay is, is, is due to the utilization of these trace minerals for functions such as the immune response and growth. So we need to do something about this. You know, we need to provide a supplementation in order to make sure that the animal is receiving what is needed for building up the immune response and growth. So if we put together the concept of these two studies, we know that the animals, as time goes, makes, it, it becomes more susceptible for because of decay of the cholesterol antibodies, but also have a, a normal decay in trace minerals, making the animal susceptible to suffer diseases, especially during times when the animals is submitted to stress, such as winning, castration, transportation, and receiving to a new farm, you know, during stress. During this uh, normal decline in, in the levels of trace minerals, you know, when the levels are maximum, you, the animal can get the optimal growth, fertility, and health. But when these trace minerals decay, you know, there are levels in which you don't see clinical uh, signs of deficiency, but the levels are getting to a point in which there might be some borderline deficiencies. And the first function that is affected is the immune system. So the animal might start suffering uh, other infections or other, other diseases, not necessarily related with a clinical deficiency of the trace minerals because the levels might be just marginal, you know, not, not uh, in the clinical deficient level. So, but the first function that will be affected will be immunity. And then the animal is more susceptible to suffer diseases such as respiratory disease or diarrhea or, uh, for example, pink eye. Another important uh, point is that during stress situations, such as during transportation and receiving to a new location, a, a high percentage, just a, 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 I'm sorry, a low percentage of animals are able to consume, you know, the feed at arrival. So we can see in this graph that the red line is showing you the percentage of calves that are eating after arrival to the new location. So during the first three, four days, just half of the calves are eating. And this means that the animals are not consuming what is required for keeping the immune system in the normal level to be able to respond to 
the you know the pathogens that they might be exposed to making the animals susceptible so you know there are some challenges to maintain adequate levels of trace minerals and uh, even you provide a uh, oral supplementation you know to the animals to powder or any mix with minerals uh, you know there are some uh, limitations to maintain those levels and I, I have here as a number one limitation is the inadequate soil and pasture mineral levels. You know, we know that there's a cattle areas in which there are recognized and confirmed deficiency of some trace minerals such as selenium, copper, and zinc. Uh, and the variability in free choice mineral intake, if we provide oral supplementation, we know that not all the animals are able to consume what is required. So there might be a variability in the way that these animals are consuming. And also, you know, in, in farms in which there is um, a, the pastures are so big, even we provide the, the oral supplementation, not all the animals will be able to walk and reach the supplementation, especially in, in, in big pastures. Also, we know that there are antagonists in feed, water, and forage that can, you know, just uh, agglutinate or can tie up to trace minerals, and then these make the trace minerals not available to be absorbed and being um, uh, utilized by the animal. So another important factor is the imbalances in feed stuff. There is a variability uh, in the formulations and the the feed, the concentrates that we can buy. We by with uh, trace minerals included, there might be some variation in the way that these fit stuff are produced and contains the trace minerals. And also uh, in, in the animals, the trace mineral requirements may vary over the year. So all of these factors make the oral supplementation as a unique way to provide trace minerals a, a, a limited a, or a limiting factor to reach the adequate levels. So it is necessary, especially for some situations in which the animals are submitted to to certain level of stress or with higher demands, or uh, you know, to provide the ad the adequate levels necessary for the system to work. These uh, situations are, for example, at weaning, uh, transportation, receiving, vaccination, castration. You know, the system will need more of these antioxidants to have a more healthy or a healthier immune system. So we know that we will require uh, to provide an additional supplementation in these uh, situations, you know, when the requirements are higher. So this was a study performed by the team of Dr. Stephanie Hansen at Iowa State University in which they compare the additional supplementation using a pulse dose trace mineral products, different products, comparing multi mean evolution versus oral drench, paste, or, or volus. And this study demonstrated you, you can see here the liver uh, selenium and also plasma selenium, for example. And you can see how the injection of trace minerals using multi mean evolution. It resulted in a significant increase in the liver selenium and also plasma selenium, which was significantly higher compared with the other products. And if you can see here in this panel, you know, the liver uh, uh, levels of selenium did not change uh, in the, with the other products. So there was no difference comparing the control group that did not receive supplementation, comparing that with drench, paste, or bolus. You know, the same situation was observed for plasma selenium, which only the injection of trace minerals was able to increase the levels of uh, zinc and selenium in plasma compared with the other groups. You know, so basically the other groups did not result in any effect, the other, the other products. So compared with animals that did not receive any mineral supplementation. These, a study was very effective confirming the importance of providing in injectable supplementation with these trace minerals compared with the oral. So the supplementation with, with injectable trace minerals has been 
demonstrated to be very effective improving the health and performance of dairy and beef cattle. And in this study, Dr. Teixeira, this is part of Dr. Vicalio uh, team at Cornell University, they demonstrated that providing an injection with trace minerals during the first week of life in dairy calf uh, reduced the incidence of diarrhea and also respiratory disease uh, compared with animals that did not receive trace minerals. So there was a decrease of uh, 8% in the incidence, the morbidity, the incidence of diarrhea and uh, combined uh, pneumonia and otitis. So confirming that, you know, supplementing with these trace minerals uh, will improve the health and the performance of dairy calves. The same or similar results are being observed in real uh, conditions, you know, uh, management conditions in beef cattle in which the injection with trace minerals was able to reduce the morbidity um, uh, you know, almost 33% or 30% and also the percentage of animals that received a second and a third dose of antibiotics was significantly reduced as well as the cost uh, in antibiotics. So basically a 5% reduction in the cost of antibiotics in these animals. So these studies are key studies that are proven the use of trace minerals can um, improve the health and performance of dairy and beef cattle. And I'm bringing these studies because uh, I'm going to continue with the showing you the models that we have performed at the University of Georgia uh, to demonstrate the specific effects of the injection with uh, multimine evolution on the immune response and protection elicited by uh, different vaccines using the, a model uh, based on bovine respiratory disease and also another model uh, based on the vaccine for neonatal calf diarrhea. So when we use these uh, models, uh, vaccination challenge models, that's a very uh, effective way to demonstrate specific effects uh, of the injection with trace minerals on the immune response. So that's the reason that we do models with vaccines and challenge, because that's a way to specifically demonstrate the effect. But the injection with trace minerals has been proven on real farm situations, improving health and performance. So in general, uh, you know this, bovine respiratory disease is um, a multifactorial and polymicrobial disease that is caused by different viruses and bacteria. And within the viruses, we know that Festivirus or VVDV is uh, one of the vi viruses that cause in, uh, the decay the immune system, so depress the, the immune response and then makes the animal more susceptible to suffer other infections like IVR or bovine respiratory syncytial virus and also some bacteria that might be part of the normal flora in the respiratory tract and then can attack the animal producing pneumonia as you see in this picture with a, a long consolidation which actually can compromise the life of the animal and has been reported with high morbidity and mortality as well and the most at, at risk cattle are the young uh, calf you know newly received and stressed and this uh, disease is characterized for high morbidity and mortality and also the increase in treatment costs. We know that vaccination is a powerful tool to prevent diseases in general, you know, and also to reduce the use of antibiotics. But we also know that vaccines are not 100% effective. There are so many factors that can affect the vaccine uh, efficiency and one of them is stress and also weather extreme uh, nutrition uh, the passive transfer you know the way the, the colostrum quality or the way that this calf uh, consume colostrum and the quality of that colostrum will affect the the way that these vaccines can stimulate or not the immune system also the vaccination route very associated highly associated with the passive transfer and the way that we manipulate the vaccine also affect the effectiveness. So 
in 2012, I, I met Dr. Habenger and Artington, and I read this study. So they tested the effect of injectable trace minerals, multi-mean evolution, on the immune response after vaccination and they demonstrated that animals uh, you know steers that receive the modified live virus vaccine against IVR together with injectable trace minerals had an increase a significant increase in the levels of antibodies compared with animals that receive just vaccination without a multi-mean evolution and so this study demonstrated an effect on I'm sorry, on one of the branches of the immune system, the antibodies that Dr. Liu was mentioning. My question was, so there is another branch of the specific acquiring immunity or immune response that is the cell mediated. So the cells, how these trace minerals might affect the cell mediated immunity. Another, another important uh, fact in that st study was that they measure the levels of trace minerals in plasma. So you can see in this graph, the concentration of copper, selenium, manganese, and zinc in blood. You know, blood samples were collected at the time of vaccination, before vaccination, you know, on day zero, and two weeks after that. So we can see the gray bar and black bars. The gray bars are the control group that receive vaccine with no trace minerals and the group, the black bars are vaccine plus multi-immune evolution. So you can see that animals that receive just vaccination, there is a normal decay in the levels of zinc, manganese, copper, and selenium after vaccination. This is because the immune system is utilizing these trace minerals to you know, produce an immune response. So animals that receive multi-immune evolution after uh, together with vaccination, they have they had an increase in the levels of copper, selenium, and the decay in zinc and manganese was less pronounced. So basically, increased the levels of copper and selenium, and also mitigated the decay in zinc and manganese. So that means that during this time, you know, when uh, vaccination is applied, it's necessary to provide an additional level of uh, additional trace mineral. Uh, supplementation in order to uh, being able to uh, provide or, or, or supply the demands, you know, for building up the immune response. So based on that, we wanted to, to test if the effect of this injection with trace minerals was able to also stimulate the cells, not only the antibody production, but also the cells. So we uh, performed this study in dairy calves and and uh, you know this is already published and this was a design so we used 30 uh, holstein calf they were uh, three months of age and uh, they received you know they were vaccinated sub q with the vaccine uh, express 5 and you know that contains the viruses and also you know with the vaccines containing manhemia and pastorella so the animals were divided in two groups. One group received injectable trace minerals and the other group re just received saline. Three weeks later, we gave a booster, you know, another dose with the same vaccines and also with a uh, multi-mean evolution uh, or saline according to the previous group. So these are the results. So we evaluated the levels of antibodies against pestivirus and we observed a significant increase in the levels of antibodies against pestivirus on day 28, which was, you know, much higher than the increase in the control group that did not receive multi-mean evolution. Also, we evaluated the percentage of animals that had a, a zero conversion. Zero conversion means four-time increase, so four-fold increase in antibodies against pestivirus and it was 80% compared to 53% in animals that did not receive trace minerals. So there was a higher proportion of calf with zero conversion, 80% versus 50, 53% in the control group, meaning that there was higher antibody titer and higher proportion of zero conversion. Also, uh, the antibody titers against myhemia hemia hemolytica 
uh, was higher in the animals that receive multimine evolution, as you can see in this graph. When we observe the proliferation of white blood cells in vitro, so basically we collected blood samples for, from those animals, and we expose those cells, the white blood cells, to the same antigens, to the, I'm sorry, to the same uh, viruses, you know, to pestivirus, to IVR, to VRSV, and Pasturella multocida. And we observe that animals that receive a multimine evolution together with the vaccine, they started having a proliferation of white blood cells before, like earlier than the animals that did not receive trace minerals. It was like two weeks earlier, they were responsive to pestivirus. So there was an earlier and also stronger proliferation of the cells, as you can see in this graph. Always, you know, the cells from animals receiving multimine evolution, you know, the proliferation of the white blood cells was much stronger and earlier. The same tendency was observed for IVR with a higher proliferation of white blood cells when the animals receive multimine evolution. And also for bovine respiratory syncytial virus, there was a higher proliferation of cells as early as seven days after vaccination. The cells were ready to respond against bovine respiratory syncytial virus. For Pasturella multocida, also uh, on day 21, um, the animals that received multimine evolution or injectable trace mineral in this group had a higher proliferation of cells. So the cells were more responsive, were stronger, and uh, were ready to, to attack in case that the animals were exposed. So the take home message from this study uh, was that uh, the injection with multimine evolution at the time of vaccination improved the liver mineral status, increased selenium, copper, manganese, and zinc, uh, increase the antibody titer to pestivirus on day 28, and also increase the percentage of seroconversion to pestivirus, and augmented the antibody titers to manhemia hemolytica, and enhanced the white blood cell proliferation to pestivirus and bovine respiratory syncytial virus, uh, and also improve the white blood cell proliferation to Pasturella multocida. So what does it mean? So basically, this study demonstrated that animals that receive a multimine evolution, they had an immune system that were, was more responsive, that was uh, stronger, that responded earlier. So that means that the animals, uh, you, you will have in your farms animals that will have a better health status. Uh, they will have, a, a, will, will have a better protection. And, you know, that might be translated into less disease, you know, less morbidity and mortality. And, and this might uh, translate into better performance. So our second study, uh, we wanted to see how was the onset of protection by vaccine in wind beef calf. So the previous study was done in dairy calf. And then the second study, we wanted to do it in beef calf. Beef calf. So we performed this study and it was published in this journal. And so basically we got 45 Angus, Angus calf and they were wind calf seven months old and then they were vaccinated at arrival. So what we did was that one group received a vaccine at arrival and uh, the other group, another group of 15 calf received vaccine plus multi-mean evolution and we had a 15 calf with no vaccine. So we gave first a, sh a shipping, a transportation of eight hours in order to simulate the you know, normal conditions. And then at arrival, one day after arrival, we gave the treatments that I already mentioned. So including a ITM, a injectable trace minerals, plus vaccine or a just vaccine or no vaccine. And then five days later, we gave a challenge with a pestivirus. So basically we gave an intranasal challenge and we evaluated the health status and collected blood and nasal swab samples and clinical status of these animals for the next two weeks. So let's see the results. 
So in this study, uh, animals that were treated with multivine evolution, they had lower scores, especially the attitude of the animals. So the animals that received vaccine plus uh, injectable trace minerals, they had a better attitude uh, with lower scores compared to animals that received just vaccine or animals that had, you know, that did not receive vaccine. And the rectal temperature, there was no significant difference between the vaccinated groups, but the animals that received, uh, that did not receive vaccine, just the infection with pestivirus, they had a significant increase in temperature, meaning that our model was confirming uh, infection and suffering disease. Also for white blood cell counts, specifically lymphocyte, one type of white blood cells, we observed that animals that did not receive vaccine had a significant decay uh, in white blood cells. And this is a, a landmark of BVDV or pestivirus infection. So there is a lymphopenia called lymphopenia or decay in the white blood cells, but the animals that were vaccinated, you know, did not suffer that decay in white blood cells. And there was no difference between the two vaccinated groups. However, the platelet counts in, in indicated that the animals that received multimine evolution had an increase, a significant increase in the platelet count, which it was a significant and very relevant finding of this study since uh, now we know that there is a potential for multimine evolution for improving the, the clotting capacity of the animals, especially for, you know, when the animals will be submitted to surgeries, for example, you know, we know that uh, multi-mean evolution is able to improve the platelet counts, and this might have a relevant impact on, on health. We measure the neutralizing antibodies against pestivirus, and we observe that the animals that receive the vaccine plus injectable trace minerals had a significant increase in the antibody titers against pestivirus, which was significantly higher than animals receiving only vaccine and animals that did not receive vaccine. So this is very important because this is meaning that the, that the animals receiving trace minerals have a higher protection, a better protection, you know, than animals just receiving vaccine. Also, we wanted to go specifically in, you know, a type of cells that are the, the, the you know, the, the quarterbacks, they are the center, the drivers of the immune system. They are called helper T cells. And uh, we observed that animals that were not vaccinated, they had a significant decay in these cells, the help helper T cells, uh, and only the animals that received a uh, multi-immune evolution together with vaccination were able to mitigate that decay in the helper T cells. So this is very important because these cells are the drivers of the immune system, and these will determine, you know, if the animals have normal levels of T helper cells or low levels of T helper cells, that will determine if the animal becomes susceptible uh, to suffer these infections, you know, if they are exposed to these uh, pathogens. So basically, the injection with trace minerals help mitigating the decay in, in helper T cells and also cytotoxic or the killer T cells. Uh, the decay that is caused by pestivirus. So the, the take home message in that second study in beef cattle uh, demonstrated that administration of multi-immune evolution improved, again, improved the liver mineral status as we observed in the previous study in dairy calves. So in beef, we observed the same and also uh, the animals, you know, the injection in, in increased the health status. Animals had a, a better attitude. They were eating better. Uh, the animals that received multi evolution and also increased the antibody titers to pestivirus and help mitigating the decay in these two types of cells, you know, the helper T cells and the killer T cells caused by pestivirus. Also increase the platelet number as I said, this is a potential impact on improving the clotting status, you know, of the animal, especially important for uh, surgeries like castration. So what is the benefit? This study 
you know, it's a model, it's a specific model based on vaccination and challenge, but these results might be extrapolated to other uh, type of pathogens and conditions because basically it's telling us that the injection with multi-mean evolution improved the health status in general. So the animals were having a um, higher antibody production and also uh, cells, T cells that were more responsive um, probably because they were multiplying or proliferating uh, more than the control group and also uh, probably because the cells were not dying due to pestivirus. So the cells were stronger and also the antibodies were higher. So these um, uh, might be uh, translated into a better health status, you know, a better performance of the animals. And remember that this study was done at field conditions. So these animals will have a better protection in case that the animals are exposed to these pathogens. And this will translate into a lower incidence of diseases in, in beef farms. Then we wanted to perform a third study uh, to test the effects on intranasal vaccination. And for that study, we use Holstein calves again uh, that receive an intranasal vaccine. And I, it's important to remember that, uh, especially in animals with um, uh, maternal antibodies, you know, the intranasal vaccination is a, 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 an essential uh, component of the health management program because. Uh, you know, the intranasal vaccine can avoid the negative effect of the maternal antibodies interfering with the, the vaccines. So that's one of the advantages of using intranasal vaccination, you know, in animals with maternal antibodies. So that was the reason we wanted to perform this study to test the effects on, of trace minerals in animals that receive intranasal vaccination. And we divided the animals into two groups. One group received a multi mean evolution and the other group receives just saline. These animals were vaccinated with an intranasal vaccine containing IVR, bovine respiratory syncytial virus, and parainfluenza 3 virus. And then we collected blood sample in the subsequent days. It's important to remember in this study, as well as in the previous studies, that the animals have had normal or adequate levels of trace minerals. Uh, liver and also uh, plasma levels of trace minerals have been normal, meaning that these, animal, these animals are not deficient in trace minerals, and we will see the effects. So, uh, so we had three groups. One group received the intranasal vaccine plus multi-mean evol evolution. One, the other group received intranasal vaccine plus saline, and the other group no vaccine. So. 60 days after primary vaccination, the animals receive a booster uh, with intranasal vaccine and also another dose with uh, injectable trace minerals. Of course. Mm -hmm. These are the animals that we use. And 49 days after booster vaccination, the animal receive a challenge with pestivirus. Uh, and one week later, we gave a, another challenge with IVR. The challenge were intranasal. And we wanted to see the, you know, the effects of trace minerals and vaccination on the health of the respiratory tract. So we uh, use an endoscope to evaluate the upper respiratory, respiratory tract of the gut. And it's important to emphasize that this is not normally performed in cattle. So it's an equipment that is frequently used for evaluation of horses, you know, the respiratory tract of horses. And since there are no studies about the endoscopy of the respiratory system in cattle, we had to create our own evaluation system. So we evaluated the nasal cavity, the throat, you know, the pharynx, the larynx, and also the trachea and the bronchi. And, you know, as I said, we evaluated the nasal cavity, the throat, you know, the pharynx and larynx, trachea and bronchi. And we evaluated the following features. We check redness, you know, the level of redness or inflammation, 
the integrity of the mucosa if they have like you know this reactivity of the mucosa or has a ulcers for example so we gave zero to three in this course and also the quality of the secretions you know the nature of the secretion it was just mucus or was mucopurulent you know or a pus so it was just a clear secretions or was very a pus let's see the the video so this a uh, video i'm going to show is the average you know is the average of the group so i'm going to show you one animal that is representing the average of the unvaccinated calf after receiving festive virus and one week later a uh, ivr and no vaccine so you can see a lot of pulse in the respiratory tract you know in the uh, uh, pharynx in the entry of the pharynx the throat and you see you know redness and reactivity severe reactivity with you know ulcers and a severe accumulation of pus in the trachea some ulcers in the bronchi in the entry to the lungs meaning that uh, these viruses uh, pestivirus and ivr were causing severe damage uh, of the upper respiratory tract you know causing respiratory disease the next video is representing uh, the average of the group that received vaccine and saline so vaccine with no trace minerals and you can see uh, that the level of inflammation of the nasal cavity was a uh, moderate so you can see secretions in the entry of pharynx the throat you know you can see reactivity of the pharynx uh, so you can see these little balls you know in the pharynx and also the secretions at the trachea and the bronchi is moderate it's a little bit lower than what we saw uh, with the, uh, in the animals that did not receive vaccine and now i'm showing you the a video of a calf that is representing the average of the group you know that received vaccine plus multi-mean evolution and you can see a significantly reduced level of damage and inflammation so you see that the nasal cavity there is some uh, mucus but it's not uh, as viscous as the other groups you know the reactivity of the pharynx is lower than the other groups so there is some secretions but it's uh, like lighter secretion more clear secretion and some reactivity but it's just lower the trachea is very clean you know you don't see the amount of pus and the inflammation of the trachea and bronchi in the following slide i'm going to show you a summary of the study so with no vaccine you see a severe reactivity of the uh, pharynx uh, you know these little balls or reactivity of the mucosa will be you know later on will be ulcers so basically this will blow and then will be ulcers and you know severe uh, inflammation and pus you know very very uh, thick pus and also this is uh, found in the trachea with severe inflammation redness and bronchi uh, in the animals that receive vaccine uh, plus saline you know you can see also reactivity of the pharynx in some uh, pause a little bit lower than in the other group and with some pause as well at the level of trachea and bronchi however animals that receive vaccine plus multi-mean evolution you see that the level of inflammation is much lower compared to the other groups you know you see um, minimum reactivity in the pharynx and larynx and the the nature of the secretions is just a mucus is just mucus it's not pus and you see significantly lower uh, amount of pus or the or secretion mucus in the in the trachea and bronchi with no ulcers so we calculated the endoscopy scores and you know you can see and then we had to apply a statistical analysis to see if there was a significant difference or not and then you can see how the injection with multi-mean evolution significantly decreased the endoscopic score you know the uh, meaning that if the score is higher that means that the inflammation was higher so the animals that received multi-mean evolution 
had a significantly reduced score compared with animals that received only vaccine or animals that received no vaccine. So basically, multi-immune evolution decreased the level of inflammation and damage of the respiratory mucosa caused by pestivirus and IVR. So just to show you, you know, after an necropsy, uh, how, you know, those ulcers look, you know, after the reactivity of the mucosa, then the next step is that this, uh, the reactivity becomes ulcers. And this is a normal sign that you can see in animals suffering IVR and also inflammation and necrosis, you know, damage of the tonsils. Also, we confirmed in this study what we saw in the previous study that the injection with trace minerals is the blue line here, you know, mitigated the decay in the T helper cells, you know, the white blood cells. And also for the killer cells, these are the CD8, are the killer white blood cells. You can see that animals that received a multi immune evolution, they had higher levels, mitigated the decay compared to the control group, the non-vaccinated and the vaccinated animals without trace minerals. So basically, this is showing us, confirming the previous findings that the injection with trace minerals improve the status of these cells, the white blood cells, the immune defense cells. So our take home message in this study was that uh, the injection with multi-immune evolution improved the liver status again, confirming the previous results and enhanced the protection against pestivirus and IVR because decreased the level of inflammation and damage of the respiratory mucosa, uh, mitigated the decay in white blood cells uh, that normally is caused by these viruses. And the conclusion of this study is that these trace minerals act in dual, having a dual effect. One is increasing the immunity, as we saw, because maintain high levels or higher levels of white blood cells, but also protecting the mucosa, the lining, you know, the barriers that Dr. Liu was talking to you at the beginning in the video. So how would it help your hair? Basically, you know, using a, or incorporating multi-immune evolution within your health hair program, uh, together with vaccination or just, in, in those stages of the production management where the animals require a higher levels of trace minerals that will improve the health you know, of the immune system uh, in both sides, the antibody production and also the, the, the cells required for maintaining um, a good immune defense. So in that way, the animals will be less susceptible to uh, the infectious agents that cause disease and the morbidity um, will be lower, significantly lower, specifically uh, morbidity against you know, pathogens such as respiratory uh, pathogens. But this, you know, as Dr. Liu was uh, talking to you at the beginning, uh, this is not only focused on respiratory disease, the use of trace minerals improving in general improve the status of the immune system, you know, the defenses. And I want to talk to you a little bit about neonatal calf diarrhea and the model that we uh, have uh, developed. And that was a study developed in between 2019 and 2020. Um, so the impact of, the, you know, neonatal calf diarrhea has an, uh, a substantial impact on health and profitability and it causes mortality in a weaned calf, we know that, and especially it affects calves that are three weeks, around three weeks of age, you know, less than one month. And there are multiple pathogens, you can see in this picture that there are viruses involved, like bovine coronavirus, uh, bovine rotavirus, uh, bacteria such as E. coli and salmonella, and also protozoa like cryptosporidium, are the pathogens that are involved and can cause diarrhea in, in calf. Some factors that are crucial for preventing and controlling uh, the incidence of uh, neonatal calf diarrhea are maintaining high, uh, the hygiene conditions, you know, sanitation and, and adequate and optimal nutrition 
as well as in, uh, performing vaccination, especially in cows, you know, in pregnant cows, in order to improve the quality of colostrum. Um, so we recommend vaccinating the animals two months before parturition. So giving the chance to in increase the levels of antibodies in colostrum. And that's the first line that will defend the calf, you know, consuming uh, uh, high col colostrum quality. So in this study, we wanted to test the effects of multi-immune evolution on response to bovine coronavirus. And basically uh, around uh, seven months of pregnancy, uh, two months before parturition, we vaccinated heifers, pregnant heifers, with the vaccine that contains uh, coronavirus, rotavirus, and E. coli. And also we gave uh, multi-immune evolution. So we had two groups of heifers. Uh, it was uh, uh, 14 and 13 heifers in each group, so 27 heifers, and we vaccinated them two months before parturition. And again, three weeks later, we gave a, a second dose of this vaccine. It's a score guard, and we gave a second shot of multi-immune evolution. So we had two groups, one, with, one group with multi-immune evolution and the other group with no trace mineral supplementation. So animals were had, again, these animals had normal levels of trace minerals, so there was no mineral deficiency. And then we measured the levels of antibodies weekly after vaccination. And we also measured the levels of antibodies in the colostrum, and then the passive transfer to the calf. After parturition, we separated the calf and we made sure that the calf consumed the, the colostrum from the corresponding them, and we measure the antibodies in the calf. So let's see the results. So we observed that the heifers that received injectable trace minerals together with vaccination, they had um, a higher antibody titers against a coronavirus, bovine coronavirus, uh, compared to the control animals. So that was something really interesting. And then when we observed I'm sorry, when we observe the colostrum from those uh, first calving heifer or cows, we observe the same tendency. Actually, it was uh, has a, a significant value, you know, less than uh, 0.1. So it was a tendency of having higher uh, antibodies against bovine coronavirus in colostrum for those uh, first calving cows that receive injectable trace minerals at the time of vaccination. And then we determined the levels of antibodies in the calves, and we observed the same tendency with a, you know, a tendency of having higher uh, antibody titers against bovine coronavirus in calf that received a colostrum uh, from cows that, that were injected with, in, with trace minerals. So basically confirming you know, the, the higher uh, immune response after vaccination when injectable trace minerals was given to the cows, also the colostrum and also uh, the passive transfer after consuming that colostrum. So in conclusion, um, the use of multi-immune evolution improved the health and immunity of dairy and beef cattle. And we observe a stronger and faster immune response to viral and bacteria uh, vaccines against respiratory disease and diarrhea in cattle. And it's very important to emphasize that vaccine efficacy is the result of proper assembly of different herd management tools, you know, and practices. But that not does not depend on a unique factor. You know, it's important to manage those factors such as nutrition, stress you know, the management and also how the personal interact with the animals. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, uh, God for all the opportunities and the help, you know, that have provided to me uh, during my life to, you know, to perform what I have done professionally and, you know, to bring me to the University of Georgia and being working uh, with this wonderful people, you know, my gravid group, the group for reproduction in animals, vaccinology and infectious diseases. So it's a huge blessing for me. And I'm so thankful for that. I, I, I really thank God for that. And also, I want to thank the University of Georgia, Dr. Wulum Saliki and others 
for you know all the support during the development of this research program in the last seven years. Uh, of course, the company Multimin USA for supporting uh, this research and also Beerback for the great opportunity to be talking to you about our experience at University of Georgia and also to other companies that also collaborated to this research. Thank you very much and I will be more than glad to answer any question. Great, thank you Roberto. I'm just gonna change presentation back to my screen now. There we go. Okay, so um, just to very quickly wrap it up, I mean, one of the things we have to remember is that what we're seeing here is multimedia evolution has been shown to improve immune function and an improved immune function therefore helps to reduce the incidence and severity of diseases beyond what we've just seen as well. Um, and of course, less disease equals more productivity. In relation to um, when to use multimedia evolution, really, the, I think the takeaway here is that you, you time it at the point of vaccination, which is supported by all the research that um, we've just heard about. Whether you're in the north or in the south, um, if you're vaccinating, generally, it is a pretty good time to give multimedia evolution. The um, only caution there is to, of course, not to give too much too close together because too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. And so you want to space it out. Uh, by space out doses of multimedia evolution, I mean, by um, between two to three months. Uh, there are also benefits for multimedia evolution on the reproductive system as well. It's not a topic that we're covering today, uh, but it, it is also a good idea to give that to the females 30 days before breeding as well. And um, if you want more information, we can certainly provide that to you um, and get, it, get you in contact with your local Verbeck representative. So I'm going to just um, chuck up a poll very quickly. So if you wanted to uh, have someone get in contact with you, feel free to um, hit that yes button on your screen that's appeared. Otherwise, yeah, feel free to click no. And if, if you select yes, then we'll make sure that someone um, is with you to answer your questions in a bit more detail. Now, um, while that's happening, feel free to also throw in some more questions on your uh, on your screen. We've got some already. Um, so apologies about going over time, but try to cover these. So the first question is around giving multimin in wieners. How much extra of these, uh, I'm just trying to paraphrase this, sorry. How much extra minerals does multimin provide if uh, we are giving these to the wieners? How much of that as a proportion of the animal's daily requirements does it make? And if extra is given, is, is it simply passed out or is it, um, or is it stored? So, Really, the, the answer to that, that does depend on, of course, other inputs of minerals that you're providing with or well, to the animals. And hypothetically, let's say you give absolutely nothing to the animal. A wiener dose is usually quite effective in providing um, half of the, what, what the animal would be capable of storing at any one given time. Because if you pr pretend that the animal is like a, a cup of water, we're essentially giving that cup, uh, we're, we're making that cup half full. So you do still need to provide. Um, oral minerals in the form of uh, whether it's from pasture or oral supplements or whatever it may be. Um, but um, you know, in a real world scenario, multimin is going to provide you know, a, a good a good supply of trace minerals. And because the liver is actually a very good storage organ, it, it does tend to store a good um, amount of that mineral. So it won't be passed out. Um, or rather not all of it will be passed out. Of course, some will be lost, but a good chunk of that will be retained and used by the animal in a later date. Okay, the next question for Roberto. Um, so why did you choose Pestivirus to, to challenge animals with? Yeah, uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, and the, you know, one of the reasons that we have been investigating Pestivirus is that in the United States have been demonstrated that Pestivirus is a, is a common that we normally often seen uh, as a, a predisposing or, a, or, a, or, a, or an, an agent that decreases the immune defenses and then predispose the animal to suffer other infections. So, uh, you know, again and again, when we study outbreaks of respiratory disease, always there, there, there is a presence of uh, these PIs, persistently infected calves, you know, that are basically disseminating um, this uh, pestivirus, which actually decreases the immune system, the immune defenses. And 
you know, due to the system in which, you know, the, the management system in which animals commingle, you know, animals from different sources in which the vac vaccination status is very variable. Uh, you know, I'm talking about uh, stalkers and, and, and feedlots, you know, so some uh, farms might control for PIs, you know, and try to keep very low um, levels of these PIs, you know, shedding BBDB, but, you know, pestivirus, but, but in other farms, there is just no control. And then when the animals commingle in the stalkers and feedlots, then uh, always we see the same tendency of having, you know, the pestivirus uh, circulating, you know, so it's a very common scenario. Uh, worldwide is not only in the United States and then you don't see clinical disease due to pestivirus because most of the strains that are you know the wild strains that are in the field are um, mild or moderate that uh, cause mild disease or no disease uh, due to acute infection when it happens but it's very frequent to have them just debilitating like weakening the immune system and then making the animals more susceptible to suffer diseases caused by manhemia and pasturella. So it's a common player that we see in outbreaks. Great, thanks Roberto. And I think um, it's yeah also reflected here in Australia as well, because we, we certainly know that in the MLA report I showed in my first slide, pestivirus is all the way um, up towards the top when it comes to the economic impact that that particular um, disease causes in, in Australia and, and how, how um, important that is for the loss of uh, productivity in, in Australia. So I think yeah, it's certainly um, a, a, a good model to use. Okay, uh, another question. If my animals are healthy and in good condition, am I going to see the same response against uh, pestivirus or other disease challenges? Yes, the answer is uh, all the studies we have done is with healthy animals. We have seen, uh, you know, we have used animals with no uh, preconditions, like no disease conditions, any uh, animals are, are, are completely healthy. And also we test the levels of trace minerals before starting our studies. And all of these animals have had normal levels in liver and, and serum. So that means that they are not deficient at all, but uh, you know, the results always have shown that providing the additional, uh, uh, you know, the, the additional source of trace minerals with multi-mean evolution have um, it resulted in, in, in improvement in, in the general immune response. So make, making the animals more responsive with a stronger response and also earlier immune response uh, which makes the animals less susceptible to suffer diseases in case that they are exposed to these pathogens. So the answer is yes, even the animals look healthy, you know, uh, especially during situations in which the animal will be more demanding of these uh, elements, talking about, you know, antioxidants and stimulate, uh, stimulating the immune system. So when the animals are more demanding on, on, on these elements, you know, providing them will actually improve the way that they respond. Great, thank, thank you. And so I'm guessing a lot of that question comes from the fact that we, we are seeing a good season in Australia with plenty of good rainfall. So um, there's plenty of grass to eat and that the condition of the animals uh, might look good, but Nevertheless, I think these animals are still um, likely to see a benefit from using multimine evolution. Uh, is that correct? Yes, yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, uh, and the last question is, uh, do you have, are you able to make any comments about immune, the immune system in relation to ringworm? That's a, an excellent question. It's an excellent question. And yeah, we haven't, we haven't done it, but in general, uh, minerals like zinc, you know, they have a, a direct effect on skin uh, and the, you know, the integrity and the health of the, of the skin. So um, I, I'm not, I, I have no doubt that it will have a healthy skin in animals and have the animals less susceptible to these, you know, skin infections. So yeah, that's a good question. And also we have been talking before about um, the potential of um, multi-mean evolution improving the health and uh, and the integrity of the mucosa. So probably it's a key element uh, in the prevention of pink eye as well. Great. 
Okay, and I think that's all the questions for today. And um, thanks everyone for, for staying on board with, with this webinar. I know we did go a little bit over time. Thank you again to Roberto, especially now that it's, uh, what is it, 11, almost 11.30 uh, your yeah. time in the, in the evening. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, we, without taking any, any more of anyone's time, uh, we'd like to say goodbye, uh, good afternoon, and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much.